Hello, everybody. I am just delighted. I'm thrilled to be here with all of you. What a fabulous program. You had so many amazing speakers. I wish I could. I've actually interviewed a few of you for a report the news hour is doing on young voters. I was so excited to be able to do that. And right now, I am really thrilled to be part of this amazing panel. You are going to meet four uh, extraordinary individuals who come from the business community, and each of their the organizations they represent has already uh, taken steps to engage with young people uh, broadly and to engage with, I guess the word we're using is disconnected youth. And it's, it's the subject that you're here to talk about, and it's something each one of them is very, very interested in. So I'm going to introduce them, and then I'm going to, as I introduce them, I'm going to ask them to tell us what their company or their organization is doing in working with young people. Uh, Meg Garlinghouse, I'm going to start with you. She is the head of social impact at LinkedIn. So Meg, start out by telling us what LinkedIn is doing with young people, and in particular with disconnected youth. Sure. So we um, are working with disconnected youth in, in two ways. One, we have a really terrific partnership with Year Up, which I know there's a big... <laughs> We are big, big, big Year Up um, fans, and we've actually helped Year Up expand their offices down in Silicon Valley. I think we were the first tech company to take on um, Year Up interns, and I wanted to just tell a quick story, if I may. Um, you know, when and it echoes one of the themes that came up earlier that um, we see this partnership not as a charitable investment. We see this as an enormous business opportunity, and when. Scott Donahue came and met with our director of IT um, a year and a half ago and sat down. He didn't say, hey, LinkedIn, are you interested in hiring a bunch of disconnected youth? He sat down and he said, hey, LinkedIn, would you like to hire some extraordinary individuals who are highly motivated, and by the way, they're pre-trained in hard and soft skills to be your next exceptional IT workers? We said, yeah, actually, we'll take six. So it was a really, really easy business decision for us to make, and I just want to um, really make that clear that our, our, we are doing this because it's the right thing for our business, and by the way, we think it also gives these individuals an opportunity that they may not have had previously. Terrific, Meg. And everybody, by the way, knows what LinkedIn is, right? I just want to be sure. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, Cheryl Oldham, who's sitting right next to Meg. Cheryl is Vice President of the Institute for a Competitive Workforce at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. And quickly, Cheryl, for the young people who may not be familiar, explain what the U.S. Chamber does, and then tell us about your connection with young people. Sure. So the U.S. Chamber of Commerce is one of the largest trade associations in Washington, D.C., and a lot of what we do, we, we essentially are the largest organization representing the interests of business in this country. And so we have, we say we represent the voices of about three million business people across the nation. And really the strength of the chamber is in its local chambers. So there's local chambers of commerce all across the country in communities everywhere. And they are very engaged um, it, with obviously youth and others in their community. And they tell us every single day how they are struggling with a skills gap. They can't find people to fill jobs uh, that are available with the skills required. And this is, you know, exactly the kind of thing that, that we're talking about today and the kinds of things that we do at the chamber. We engage in policy and we engage in advocacy to try to, um, you know, sort of affect change here at Washington, but also at the state level. Great. Thank you, Cheryl. Uh, sitting next to Cheryl is Dave, David Nagel. He is the Executive Vice President of BP North America, BP, of course, the oil company, so you don't need to tell us what the oil company is, but tell us, Dave, what are you doing? What is the company doing right now in working with young people and in particular with disconnected young people? Thanks, Judy. It's great, great to be with you all here today. Um, we're the second largest producer of oil and gas in this country. We've got about 23,000 employees, but there's nearly a quarter of a million jobs in our supply chain. And the energy future for this country is bright. The energy, the future for manufacturing is bright. But when I talk to the manufacturers, the match between the skills that need to be done due to the high technologies in our industry and the workforce coming through, there's not always a match. And so uh, things that we're doing, we're working with uh, schools, whether it's high schools, community colleges, universities, on helping this. We work with the National Action Council on Minorities in Engineering 
but to try to create a pipeline of engineers. And uh, I'm here actually with a Boy Scout hat on uh, because we're very involved in the Explorer program, which is designed for 14 to 20 year olds to help them try to get a better read on what their career interests might be. And my apology, I was supposed to mention the Boy Scouts when I introduced you, but that's, yeah. that's the other part of what Dave is representing. Our final panelist is Denise Hebner. She is head of diversity and inclusion Americas at UBS. So Denise, tell us first what UBS is, what it does, and then tell us about what you're doing with young people. So UBS is a financial firm. We're based in Switzerland, have been uh, in existence this year. We celebrated our 150th anniversary. So we work with high net worth clients and provide them uh, financial solutions. We have an investment bank, global asset management. Um, so what are we doing with young adults? So the, the challenge that we had faced with UBS was how do we create a workforce that emulates the communities that the firm operates in because we found the universities were not producing enough women, Hispanics, and people of African descent who were studying technology and financial um, uh, curriculums. Uh, so what we did, we decided to create an intern academy, so literally we're manufacturing our own pipeline. And the way they do, we do that is I work with high schools in New York City. I also work with programs like Year Up. <laughs> so, and I do have bragging rights. Four of my interns, wherever they are, um, are out there. So two from New York and two from Chicago. <laughs> And we provide internships, so it's a six-month program, and it's all about exposure because when they start with us, they don't understand what it looks like to be in this industry. What could a technology um, career look like? And what we find is once they start feeling it out and getting the experience, they now switch into an IT curriculum, and we are literally changing what that dynamic looks like at university. Terrific. Okay, so we've heard from each of the panelists. I want to go back and talk to each one of you about why it makes sense. You touched on this. You talked about the skills gap, but why does it make sense? And, and, and coming back to you, Meg, you were telling me before we came out here that LinkedIn has an, its own platform that's, that's designed to do what we're talking about today. Tell the audience and all so, of us about that. So what, what I was saying is, um, you know, this audience segment is important to link in not just as an employer, but as part of our platform. Um, we are really, really committed and interested in making sure that youth are part of the LinkedIn platform. Our vision at LinkedIn is to create economic opportunity for professionals around the world. And that's not just the person who just graduated from business school, it's anyone who has a professional career dream. And so that's you in the audience right now. And part of, part of the challenge, as you guys probably know, is social mobility is hard if you don't have social capital. So if you didn't grow up in a community where you have connections to people in these jobs, it's going to be harder for you to access those. So the LinkedIn platform is in some ways an, an equalizer. And I just strongly encourage you guys, if you're not on LinkedIn now, to join LinkedIn. And I encourage the professionals in the audience to, you know, to reach out and connect with uh, a, a person who may not have the, the normal connections that some of us grew up with. Um, I think it's an extraordinary opportunity. Networks are, are you know, what makes the world go round, and as well as pathways to, to career professionals. If you identify someone whose job you want, look them up on LinkedIn, see how they got where they were, reach out to them, send them an email, and see if they'll meet you for coffee. It's an extraordinary way to make important connections. And just quickly, Meg, can you give us an example of how that could work? I mean, somebody in a particular field, how could that work on LinkedIn? Sure. So um, let's say you are interested in um, a, a, a career in social media marketing. I'll, I'll be egocentric about it. Um, you could, well, you could reach out to me, for example, and, or you could actually, even a better example is go, go on LinkedIn. We have an advanced search tab, and you actually can search on skill. You could say, I'm interested in, in talking to someone who has mobile skills, works at Facebook, and went to U University of Kansas. You can search on that, and they'll come up with a, a search results, and you can reach out and connect with that person. Cheryl. Tell us more about why at the chamber your businesses, you talked about the skills gap, but talk about the reality of that. What does it mean when businesses can't find 
the young people who they need to fill certain positions? And how do you make those connections in the community? Well, I mean, what it means is, um, you know, jobs are going unfilled in this high economic, you know, in this, this sort of uh, crazy economic time we're in and high unemployment, yet jobs are going unfilled. And it's, it's heartbreaking, really. I mean, there's great jobs out there. And, um, you know, our members tell us we're having a hard time filling them. I mean, what is the biggest sort of, you know, indicator of opportunity in this country is, is, is education and the, the, the type of education that you get. And so that's why we're so focused on sort of the whole pipeline, right? Starting from K through 12 and, um, and all of the challenges that we're having in that system. And the things that we can do in the business community is extremely engaged in, in sort of policy and how do we make sure that every child is getting the education they deserve, um, you know, with a specific focus. I mean, we're still not graduating half of, you know, African-American males on time in this country. I mean, that's, you know, th you're not going to get a job and you're not going to be able to, to succeed if you can't graduate from high school. And then questions about the, va the, the quality of the high school diploma that, that you are getting. And then obviously issues with the workforce development system and, and higher education, as Senator Rubio talked about, the data in higher education is so severely lacking. It's so critical what he's promoting with Senator Wyden to say, you know, you should have that information about what it's going to cost you and can you get a job and what am I, you know, before you sort of invest in this huge, uh, you know, life investment process. What would you add to that, David Nagel, both from the Boy Scouts perspective and from the BP perspective? Well, I, I think I'd start um, exploring is different than when I was a Boy Scout a long time ago. Um, exploring is all about careers. It's for men and women from all walks of life, all walks of life, ages 14 to 20, and uh, they gather and explore posts and explore one of 12 different career areas, some of the most uh, interesting ones to folks are aviation and science and engineering, but there's also arts and the humanities. And they meet once or twice a month for a couple hours, and there are over 5,000 of these across the country. And the main purpose is to get practical experience working with people to try to find out, is this a career area that you're interested in or actually as important, you know what, I really don't like this. So that you don't spend a lot of time studying for something only to find out that it's not what you want to do. And um, I, I encourage folks to, to look at that. The, the other thing that they have is they have an online survey tool. They also have a paper tool for people that don't have access to the internet. But it's called exploringyourcareer.com. And it lets you look at, in about six to 10 minutes, 20, 200 career fields, and it's free to the schools, and it's a tool that everybody can use, and it's widely accessed and, and, and widely enjoyed uh, by, by the guidance counselors and so on. It's just a way of honing in and understanding what the interests are. And, and the leading careers um, are, are, are in, in health fields, in, in, in nursing, but also in teaching and also in, um, in, uh, in, uh, in the military. So that's kind of what the survey data is telling people about what's out there. But it's a great, rich resource. Uh, there are over 100,000 folks involved in it right now, and about 3 million have gone through it over the last 15 years. And, and Boy Scouts are in most communities, is that right? Yeah, they are. Every They're all over the country and volunteers all over the place. Terrific. Denise Hebner, pick up on this. I mean, talk some more from the perspective of a financial institution like UBS. That's not a perspective we've, we've you know, the other three have, have represented. What, why does it make sense to have this kind of a connection uh, with young people and particularly with those young people who maybe haven't had the advantages that others have? Well, the sustainability of an organization like UBS is how thriving the communities are. So if we're operating in communities like New York, which does have a high uh, number of uh, disconnected or, or say underemployed young adults, we cannot continue to thrive. So it's important to actually build up the community so they can join the economic mainstream. And the other thing is we provide financial solutions. So as the demographics are changing, so we're seeing um, a higher number of African Americans and Hispanics who are, who are accumulating wealth, we need to start looking more like them. So we have to get more of that talent in the organization. So it's about, it all comes down to the business case of 
why is it important to have diverse talent? And that's part of it. And I think um, to, to tap into um, some of the comments made earlier is, I think a lot of corporations could give more thought to getting more involved into the schools. We talked about this in a, in a, a table discussion earlier that there seems to be a systemic problem with the education system. So if we can take the millions and millions of employed workers and have them get more involved in the school systems earlier in with the mentoring, with the reading, and start as young as say the second grade and follow the student through, I think you'll see uh, improvement with the graduation rates and we can actually change this uh, trend. Let me just very briefly ask each one of you to say what it is that your organization, your company uh, has as your goal. I mean, what more do you want to achieve in the next few years in this area? Starting with you, Meg. Core of the skills gap issue is really understanding the skills gap. So, for example, in Detroit, if there's a skills gap there, is it there's too many auto mechanics and not enough neurosurgeons, or is it too many auto mechanics and not enough tele communication service people. And if it's the latter, well, there are very, very actionable things that we together can do about that. So I think making this information more transparent about what the supply and demand of the skills gap really looks like is super important. I think it's a, an opportunity for LinkedIn to play since we sit on mounds and mounds of data that can help put a magnifying glass on this. Cheryl, what about with the Chamber of Commerce? So I think we are really going to focus, um, starting tomorrow actually, with a, a convening we're having specifically focused on this skills gap called Help Wanted. And I mean, I think we need to make some serious um, uh, reforms to, for example, the Workforce Investment Act. I mean, this is the you know federal government's major investment. Um, partnership with communities to really um, train folks in jobs that are available, and we need to do a, 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 such a better job of understanding what are the jobs available in that community, and that really is what should be happening through these local workforce boards, and we should be training people for jobs available in those communities, and so that's what we're really going to take a hard look at. David Nagel, what about BP and the Boy Scouts? Um, in, in some ways, it's the same story. In, in uh, a lot of the communities where we work, uh, we have jobs, we need to make sure that the folks that live there uh, have the skills to be able to do those, and so we work with the community colleges, we work with the high schools and universities to, to get and to develop those skills and to continue to match those. Um, and with the Boy Scouts, they're on that same path, and then there's another resource that the Boy Scouts utilizes. I mentioned that over 100,000 folks are involved as participants in the Explorer program. They're supported by almost 30,000 adult volunteers that are in there, that know their industries, know the skills, and really are dedicated uh, to helping people get practical experience, not stuff that you can just read about. I mean, that's good. But to actually find out how this works and build up your leadership skills and your own self-confidence. And Denise, what about, what about UBS? So with UBS, we ran a, a mentoring program in a Brooklyn high school. In the past four years, what we've seen by meeting with the students every Monday for the school year those students who are involved in the program, 90% of them actually were promoted to the next level. That's 20 um, points, percentage points higher than the average for the school. So a commitment that the firm is making is getting more involved with the middle and the high school and providing this mentoring because we think it's critical. The other thing outside of um, year up, which we're going to be expanding. Um, <laughs> Um, with the year up, it's expanding into other functions in the organization. Right now, we're in operations, HR, and IT, and to take that platform because these young adults can do more than IT. They're analytical, they're motivated, they have innovative ideas on how to process, make process improvement or cost avoidance. And then the other thing that we've started is elevating entrepreneurs. It's a program where we're working with small businesses and providing them financial resources from a um, uh, a, a advisory standpoint, connecting them with successful clients that we have in that industry to help them take their business to the next level. Because at, since 1980, most jobs have been created from small businesses. So we feel that. Sorry. We've only got 20 seconds left. So let me ask each of you in 10 or 15 seconds. 
to tell anybody out there listening, watching, either for themselves or the people they know, their friends, if they're interested in doing something with LinkedIn, what should they know? What should they do, Meg? It, well, if you don't already have a LinkedIn profile, sign up. It takes literally 10 seconds. And if you do have one, reach out to someone you know who may be a fall into the category of disconnected youth and ask them to connect. Uh, from the chamber perspective, I'd say, um, you know, local chambers are definitely a great way to sort of connect with um, various partnerships and opportunities and, and things happening in a community. If you're a business leader out there, I would say, um, you know, get engaged in these issues in a real and meaningful way like all of these folks are. Um, it's kind of sort of time to get off the bench on some David. of this. Real quickly, if you or someone you know uh, is interested in exploring the program either to participate or as an adult volunteer, contact the Boy Scouts in your district or across the country. Okay. Finally. <laughs> I've forgotten the question. <laughs> the question is, for yo any young person out there who's interested in what UBS is doing and wants to know more about it, wants to connect, what would you suggest they do? Um, if you want to connect, you can research our website. You can send me an email, denise.hebner at ubs.com. The way to get into our organization in this program is through a connection with a year up or a non an empower. And I guess to use a year up phrase is um, you have to lift as you climb, so do not forget where you came from. Let's thank all of these panelists. Aren't they terrific? Thank you.